Nothing good comes a crime. Nothing at all. It affects so many people, it has such a negative effect on your community, your family, yourself. It's just not, you know, it's not the way to live. Like, I understand why kids carry knives, I understand why kids commit crime, because I've been there, I've done it all. But I also understand the path that it's gonna take you down. And I'm gonna sit here and tell you now, it's not worth it. Like, I'm very, very lucky to even be sitting here. A lot of my friends are either dead or serving life sentences right now. And I honestly believe that I've been given a second a chance to share my message, which is why I've taken the time today to sit down and share the message and tell you guys that you have the potential. So my name is Mikhail Wright, I'm from Birmingham, I'm 33 years old, I served 10 years in prison, I've now been out crime free, uh, running a legitimate business for 5 years. So being expelled from school for me was the first sign of like going on a slippery slope and then I had like trials to go in other schools and within 2-3 weeks the school was like yo this kid's too bad we don't want him till eventually um, I think I left and there was no point really going back. As I said, I couldn't really see how school was going to get me to where I needed to get. I didn't really fit in with the formula, formal mainstream education. My first sign of being an entrepreneur, what people class as an entrepreneur, was when I was about 15, maybe even younger than that, but about 12, 13, when I started selling bikes. I used to find bikes on the street. Um, I'd oil up the chain, I'd strip the paint off, I'd spray it, respray it, etc. And I'd, you know, sell it for 50, 60 quid. And obviously people used to say, oh, can you get me a bike? Can you get me this? Can you get me that? Obviously, I very early on learned if you create a demand for something, then you can make money, which is kind of where like crime came in because obviously I had a demand to sell stuff because I always used to get stuff and sell it once. And then somebody used to ask me again, can you get me a video player? Can you get me a DVD player, etc., etc." So I went through a period of buying and selling. And then I went through a period of thinking, I actually need a product that I can sell consistently, which is where I first started selling fake clothes back then. I started selling um, like trainers and fake t-shirts and fake jackets to all like the elders people. I didn't tell them it was fake at the time. Um, I think by the time I got to like 17, 18, I had a lot of people looking for me saying, yo, the stuff you sold me was fake, etc." But obviously these was, um, that was my means to an end. That was my means to survival. Um, I always wanted to start a business, but I actually didn't know how. I was lost, you know what I mean? I didn't really have the internet in them days. Um, it just wasn't as easy as it is now to actually start up a business. So when I was like 15, I started having loads of difficulties at home and I got kicked out. So now I've been kicked out. I needed more money, you know, making 50 pound or 30 pound or 40 pound or 100 pound even a day because I had expensive habits back then, like going partying and buying trainers for 150 pound and stuff, do you know what I mean? Um, it wasn't enough money. So then I kind of ha started hanging around with an older group of lads. And that's where I started getting on the crime ladder and started, you know, stolen cars. And it just really, really escalated. And for most of it, um, there was good times, but spiritually I knew that what I was doing was wrong and I kind of knew that it was going to catch up on me um, because I think anything that comes easy always kind of end, ends bad. So that obviously led me on to more escalation and more escalation and by the time I was 18, I was in prison. When I was very young, I was like kind of like really, really against the police and really, really thought that they was trying to stop us from what we were trying to do. You, you don't really want to be living around that sort of crime, do you know what I mean? Like, so then I realised I was a failed criminal and I had to look at myself and feel like you've never failed this much at anything you've tried, everything you've ever done, within the first or second time you've kind of really succeeded really well or you've knocked it on the head and said it wasn't for me. So I thought it's stupid of me to keep getting involved in crime and going back to crime when the severity of the consequences are not only affecting me but they're now affecting my family and affecting my victims and other people's families. So I kind of decided to turn my back on crime because it just wasn't for me. I went to prison when I was 18, came home when I was 28. Um, a lot of my friends had that run, what I've been talking about, of you know me sitting in prison watching them do all this designer clothes, do all this partying, doing all this champagne lifestyle, almost with a bit of envy um, and wanting to have another crack at it, almost like, why didn't it work out for me? And then now I'm out, I'm the legitimate one. And a lot of my friends are now just getting sentences in their mid 30s where they've got you know 10 year old kid, 12 year old children who are going through senior school who need them. I think about five years ago, I kind of sat there, had a reflection of my life and I kind of um, openly admitted to myself that I was born to struggle, that I was always gonna struggle. Um, but if I was gonna struggle, I was gonna struggle at 
what I wanted to do, do you know what I mean? I was going to struggle at things that was going to benefit me, things that was going to help my life, things that was going to help other people who was witnessing my struggle. Um, it would be unfair for me to say everybody should go through adversity. However, through struggle, it does build character. And the way I look at tasks and challenges and problem solving now is very different to someone who's been through no struggle because actually a problem will arise and I'll kind of struggle it out and think, oh, this is easy, I can get through this because I've been through 10 times worse. So I reached a point where I'd absolutely hit rock bottom. I lost all my confidence. I lost all my friends. Most of the people who I loved deserted me. I was in a situation where I either needed to fight or flight. You know, at the end of the day, there was nobody around me that could do it for me. I had to do it for myself. And I decided that I didn't want to be another statistic and just be another, you know, young man who had been thrown to the wayside. So that's kind of like my feeling of post crime and how it's affected my friends. But personally, how it's affected me, it's been very, very difficult. And um, the main reason, which I haven't talked about in this documentary, why I started a business, because I went to 40 job interviews. I literally went to every single job interview for every job. I was determined to live a straight life. And obviously on paper, it was just like, we'll give you a call, we'll give you a call, we'll give you a call. And going back to talk about reputation, integrity, um, nobody wants to really take the risk. It's not worth it, do you know what I mean? Once your name's tarnished. So I really struggled with that. So no one was giving me a job because of my criminal record, my past, do you know what I mean? That's all they could see. They wasn't willing to give me a chance based on um, who I appeared to be now. That piece of paper, that criminal record was a big blocker for me. Um, also, the other difficulties for me were, and still exist, um, travel. Travel is really difficult when you're like kind of on license from prison, probation. Um, credit rating, you know, being out of society for so long and just wanting to get finance and having no credit rating and no history and phoning up to get a car um, for, let's say, £400, £500 a month, which you can actually physically afford because you're running a business that is, you know, doing enough numbers to pay for that. But when you actually try and get finance from somebody, they can't see that you're credible to borrow from them because they're saying, where have you been for the last five years? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, where's your credit history? Like, post-crime, is difficult for for a long time i kind of would say i had a bit of like post-traumatic stress like now when i hear banging and stuff like that it doesn't bother me but i've seen that many violent things happen in prison um people getting hot watered stabbings etc etc even before prison my whole lifestyle was that volatile and negative and the things that i'd seen never really left me do you know what i mean it's only even now um I'm not gonna lie, a lot, some of those things um, are beneficial because I'm a lot alert, do you know what I mean? When I walk into a place, I'm alert. The way I analyze things, there is some positives that I can take from it, but a lot of the stuff is negative, do you know what I mean? Not being able to trust people, being suspicious, it's not really a way that um, you wanna live. It's not a way that you wanna live your life. So the reason why I actually done bodybuilding and decided to do a show because I knew that I needed some sort of sense of achievement and after letting everybody down for so long, I needed some sort of claim, I needed some sort of title, I needed some sort of validation. This wasn't for anyone else, I just needed to validate myself. I needed to do the show and I needed to win to tell myself, you are good enough. The feeling of me winning my first show was like, yeah man, you, you, you know, you, you can do this, like you, you, you're on the right path, you're doing it, you're, you're, you know, you've got the dedication. You, I, I, it installed that self-belief and confidence in me that, going through this rocky path and losing everything that had kind of battered me and dragged me through a bush and I was kind of no longer confident. I thought I was confident, but I didn't really have that confidence. After winning that first show, I was like, yeah, let's get it, let's go, I'll do whatever it takes. And from that moment, I was willing to, again, make whatever sacrifices it took for me to have to be successful. So after winning my first show, I started to see the difference, the change in people, the change in my friends. After winning my second show, I remember walking into the shop and someone says, me, what's happening, champ? And like, obviously this to me was a thing that I only ever heard Mike Tyson get called or Muhammad Ali, like really, really successful, powerful boxers. And then I was thinking, champ, he's a bit, he's going a bit over the top. But then obviously after my third show, my fourth show, people kept saying, what's going on champ? What's happening champ? And I actually kind of realized, yo, you're actually a champion. Do you know what I mean? Um, you've, you know, went into a competition with, especially when you win a British finals with hundreds and hundreds of people across the country have competed, have trained hard, have dieted, have, have ate right to try and win this competition and you was the one who came out on top. And I think my last show was the hardest and my last show was probably where I kind of first took a little knock and kind of dip in my confidence of oh, this show, am I gonna win this show? But it's where all my pain 
and all my struggle kind of kicked in and kind of made me work that little extra bit harder, which is again why I say, you know, you young kids um, who are involved in crime have the competitive advantage than, you know, kids who have been, you know, showered with, you know, love and gifts and not had, you know, um, maybe some of the social factors um, of broke down families, single parent families, you have more of a fight in you, so you need to be using that fight as something worthy, as something credible. I remember my friend saying to me, oh, you need to use Instagram, you need Instagram, and I was like, no, we don't use Instagram where we come from. We don't use that sort of software, sort of being brainwashed and still having this sort of like low level hood mentality. I didn't want any sort of devices around me. But then I kind of started scratching my head and thinking, and actually I've made a pact not to be involved in crime. So actually now being on the internet, although it's one of my biggest fears, I'm gonna face my fear and do it. So we made myself an Instagram account. I remember putting out a fitness video because fitness was, again, um, something that I identified with myself as one of my gifts. And I remember deadlifting something like 350 kg. Um, I don't know if I could do that today, I was a lot lighter. Deadlifted 350 kg and I think I had like something like 400 followers the same day or something crazy like that. About 40 comments and I was like, yo, actually people actually care about this. It was the weirdest thing ever. I think people care about what I'm doing and that is the spirit of an entrepreneur. It's basically using your brain as analytics and reading. Um, into business, okay cool, so 400 people have just followed from me doing this deadlift and 40 people have just liked it, that means what I'm doing um, is monetizable, people will buy something from me, I can sell something, which is the same skill um, as a low level drug dealer. So anyway, I kind of continued to do that, I continued to build, I continued to put out content of value, I started putting out quotations which I knew people could sort of um, get a uh, sort of feeling of who I was, do you know what I mean? I, I, my, basically my job then was to connect with people. So I connected, pe connected with people via social media. I think I had my first sponsor after being out about three months. And my first sponsor was something like, um, I think it was like 1200 pound, been out about 12 weeks. So I was now earning my first legitimate money. Um, I had a very close mate, mate at the time and he was my cameraman so we split that £1,200, we both had £600 each. Soon got a next sponsor, then I got a food sponsor and then I got a clothing sponsor. So now I was in a position through social media where I was getting my food for free. Um, I was getting my clothes for free, although I didn't like some of the clothes at the time. And I was um, making money, I was making legitimate income so I was soon seeing the power of social media. Um, Shortly after that, I went for a very, very rocky period where I wasn't making any money. I'd kind of lost all my sponsors and, you know, people move on and sponsors move on. And so I got to the stage and I thought, actually, I need my own product now. I need my own brand. Um, my best mate at the time kept saying to me, Venom Power, Venom Power, Venom Power, call your brand Venom Power. And I really didn't like it. I was like, Venom's my old nickname from the streets. I'm trying to get away from everything um, associated with the name Venom. And then it stuck. People started commenting, Venom Power, Venom Power, hashtag Venom Power, hashtag Venom Power. So I went and got some t-shirts printed, which cost me probably about 40, 50 pounds, which wasn't a lot of money. Uh, went online, really see the web website, brought some plain t-shirts, found someone who could print, and then I started putting my t-shirts on, which was my first bit of branding, where people started recognizing the brand. And then once people started saying it back to me, I kind of got a feeling, I sort of kind of created a movement. And I said to my mate, I remember saying to everyone, yo, I want to sell energy. You're like, what are you talking about? I'm saying like, my, you know how I am in the gym hype, you know how my personality is. I want to sell energy to people. I'm like, what you want about how you're going to do that? So I was at the gym one day and I tried a pre-workout and it sent me crazy. It was like a caffeine kick product. I was lifting more, I felt better. But I had a horrible come down off it. I felt really, really bad. I had a really, really bad crash and I decided that I wanted to create a product um, that done the same thing, but without the negative side effects. I managed to create my product, like my, the feeling when Venom Power came to me in a tub. In fact, the first time I created Venom Power, I created it with some partners, some friends of mine, and that was a great feeling. We went through a process of that. We um, exhibited at some massive expos, but then I think about two years in, I'd done it for the first time on my own, and when I held that product and I held that baby, um, I didn't really take it in too much, because it was like, yo, there's loads of work to be done, but actually getting somebody to come on my website that I'd built or had built for me um, from Philippines, from Australia, from Holland, etc., from all over the world to buy my pre-workout was the craziest thing ever, do you know what I mean? And it was satisfaction um, and fulfillment that actually all my hard work was now starting to pay off. 
and then I really sat down and actually thought, actually, this is actually no different to selling any other product, whether you're selling a half ounce of weed, a kilo of crack, a kilo of coke, whatever you're selling, it's exactly the same thing. You've got a product, you've got a manufacturer or supplier, and then you've got a customer. To retain that customer, you need to give the customer a good product, um, good customer service, and then your customer will return. Um, which is kind of what got me thinking that a lot of the kids at the moment, or a lot of you kids, if you're watching this, who are actually committing crime and wasting your life have a competitive advantage to survive in business because you're already risk takers, you're already taking losses, you've already, you know, been through, probably dragged through the bushes, do you know what I mean, and come out the other side. So actually be patient and put your time into something that makes sense. So I've reached a point in my career, in my business, um, that I don't feel like going back to crime anymore, which is a great feeling. But I'm five years in that, and to be totally honest, for the first three years, um, it was always kind of in the back of my mind, if this doesn't work, if this doesn't work, if this doesn't work. Because actually, having that self-belief and that self-confidence that what you're gonna do is gonna work, it, it, you know, it, it takes a lot out of you. But then I've, I always had to remind myself that actually going back to crime, I'd always end up back where I was. I'd always be 10 steps behind where I am now. So actually, I just had to kind of persevere on. No matter how difficult it got, you know, I'm painting this pretty picture now, but there's times in my business where I lost my business. Well, I think I lost my pre-workout business four times. You know, people online might have sort of forgot now, but if they really think back, Venom Power's been rebranded four times, it's been Mikhail White Supplements, it's been VP Supplements. I've lost it four times where, I mean, I've pretty much lost all my money in stock. I've had problems where my product went hard. Do you know what I mean? Like, but these are not problems that you're not gonna face as a criminal. You're gonna take losses, you're gonna lose stock, you're gonna have people rip you off. Do you know what I mean? So actually, these are things that I was prepared for and willing to keep persevering. These are not things that should deter you from running a little bit legitimate business because it's gonna be hard. It's not gonna be easy. So some of you young people are gonna be watching this and thinking, how do I start a business with normally? You're probably sitting there thinking, how am I going to do it? You can start a business for free. You can start a business right now. The minute you get off this documentary, you can literally go on YouTube, you can go on Google, and you can start your research for free. But like I said, like unbeknown to me, when I was starting my business, there is actual websites that will crowdfund you. Come up with your website, you put your idea, come up with your idea, sorry, you put your idea onto this platform, and you will meet a whole network and a whole realm of people. Um, who have similar interests, similar business ideas, and people who are looking to invest in your ideas. And not to excuse the way I behaved when I was younger, or the way the generations before me behaved, but it was very, very difficult to meet people um, different from the people that you're surrounded by. A lot of us became products of our environment. Now you can remove yourself from your environment, climb into the internet, and the world is a lot smaller, and the opportunities are endless. So one of the questions that I'm often asked is, can you make money via social media? And the answer is yes. Um, it's not easy, it does take time. So simply, I'm gonna simplify it, build your platform, gain some traction, build a following, and then once you get your following and once people are engaging with you, and once you've kind of built yourself a little sort of tribe, a little brand, um, you can then either contact companies or companies will contact you to promote their brand, creating an Instagram account and a YouTube account and a Facebook account, that can be literally your shop front. You can literally go from there and build a business. So here are three tips to starting a business. Tip number one, look inside yourself, be true to yourself. If you're passionate about an idea, my, my advice is that you start your business around that idea because it won't feel like such hard work. If you're passionate about something, the chances are you're gonna stick at it. Tip number two, do your research. You might be passionate about something, but do your research and make sure the product or the service that you're providing that is in line with your passion makes sense. Do your research on the markup, do your research on how much it's worth, how much you're gonna sell this product for, if other people are selling this product, where it's being sold, and how you're gonna get this product into your hand in the first place. So tip three is to make it work. Make it happen, believe in yourself. A man once said to me that most of the greatest ideas are in the graveyard. People who have had wonderful ideas, spent years doing research, came up with this idea, knew it would work, but never had the balls to go out there and do it. So believe in yourself. Always remember, never forget that you have the potential.